Hello and welcome to the Club Development Scotland podcast brought to you by Supporters Direct Scotland. We're delighted to be welcoming Stuart McCaffrey, former Inverness Caledonian Thistle, St Johnston and Greenock Morton player to the podcast this week. Uh, and although we are always hugely interested in his playing days, we're going to be speaking to him more specifically about his current professional occupation, which is its Chief Operating Officer at the Scottish Football Partnership and Trust. Um, in amongst the interview, we speak to Stuart about the huge impact the Trust and Partnership have, have made to Scottish football since starting over 20 years ago. Um, we discuss the level of support the Trust uh, specifically have been able to offer clubs and, and specifically with, with women's football during the COVID crisis. And we get some tips for clubs when it comes to applying for funding. So without further ado, here is Stuart McCaffrey, Chief Operating Officer at the Scottish Football Partnership and Trust. Thank you very much for joining us today, Stuart. I wondered if you could perhaps start off by telling us a little bit about um, both the partnership and the Scottish Football Trust and uh, what the relationship is between the two and, and what the sort of differences are as well. Yeah, sure. So the Scottish Football Partnership was was born out of an organisation uh, called the Football Trust, which used to invest into to all of the home nations. Um, I suppose it was a bit like the lottery of the day. It was, it was spending and distributing Littlewoods Pools funds. Um, and, and, you know, as I travel about just now, you'll still see community pavilions, senior grounds with the, with the plaque that will have Littlewoods Pools, you know, money invested. So, that, you know, it's nice to see them as we go about. So we, we, we evolved out of that organisation essentially being wound up. Um, and what happened was there was a, a proportion of the money left to be, to be spent in Scotland. There was no vehicle to spend it. Um, and the Scottish FA at the time and the Scottish Government through Sports Scotland came together to, to create this vehicle uh, to not only spend the money that was going to be apportioned to Scotland, but also to, to be a custodian of the money that had just been pledged. So, for example, after the Taylor report, you know, many of the, the, the clubs in Scotland had to have all-seater stadium, uh, stadiums. So clubs like Dunfermline, Dundee United, Aberdeen, St Mirren would have had, you know, potentially millions of pounds from the, from the, the old football trust. And, you know, that money had to be protected, you know, it had to be looked after. So we were that vehicle that was that was, cre that was created. And um, at the time, you know, set up with a pretty broad brush to, to support Scottish football at every level, you know, how the game was played, where it was played uh, and how it was consumed, consumed by uh, spectators. So a pretty broad, you know, sheet of paper to work from. Um, so that was back, um, you know, around about the year 2000 when that was created. Um, and it's a good cause organisation. Again, still, you know, funded largely by the Scottish FA, with Sports Scotland still as our, our, our other partner. Um, the reason we established the trust, um, and I suppose I, I should should probably mention that our equivalent down south is the Football Foundation, which is obviously, uh, I think, the UK's biggest sporting charity. Um, very fortunate because from the outset, uh, a percentage of TV revenue goes to them. You know, the bigger the TV deal becomes for the Premiership, the the more money that the, that the foundation has to, to spend in England. So slight difference from ourselves. We don't have that luxury. Um, but we were still set up as a good cause organisation, similar to them. Um, the reason we established the, the, the Trust, which is a, a Scottish registered charity, did that in 2014. That was really so that we could do a couple of things, have more of a focus on grassroots, but also as a charity, you know, make it more possible for us to, you know, to, to seek funding from other sources, for example, from other charities, uh, UEFA Foundation for Children, for example, who invest in our work. And also more recently with some of the philanthropic donations that we've had um, you know, from people like uh, James Anderson. So the, the purpose of having two vehicles was that we could then do more to cover you know, both the professional end of the game, perhaps through the company, um, and, and then the trust you know, focusing on grassroots. So in some respects, quite similar to sort of like a football club that might be registered as a charity and a, and a sort of a community arm, which is the foundation, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think it was important to, you know, to, to have both of those vehicles to try and do more to, to support the game. Um, so, yeah, that, that was the ethos behind having two. And, and, and at present, I'm very fortunate to, on a daily basis, um, you know, oversee the running of both organisations for a, a really passionate board of directors and trustees. Yeah, absolutely. So, so since the partnership started up in 2000 and, and the trust in 2014, do you have sort of a sense of the, the level of impact that you've had in terms of the amount of money awarded and um, I suppose social impact that you've created as well? 
Yeah, well, in, in terms of the, the sort of financial um, impact, um, just slightly over twenty-one million pounds. Um, obviously, the, the vast majority of that has come from the from the, the SFP, given it's been going quite a bit longer. Um, and, and as I said earlier on, that's a pretty broad brush, you know, looking at investment into the professional game for club infrastructure. Um, you know, we, we follow the requirements that uh, clubs have to, to make for club licensing, uh, which are set by the Scottish FA. So quite a lot of investment into infrastructure. Maybe some of the things that people uh, and, and fans don't maybe uh, ordinarily notice, but, you know, investment into things like flood lighting systems, uh, turnstile systems, you know, safety provision within the ground, accessible facilities, um, maybe things that aren't the most exciting at times, but things that are very important, you know, so that clubs can have a safety certificate, they can meet the criteria, and football can be played. Um, I, I'm always interested to watch um, some of the games in the Scottish Cup, uh, you know, particularly when floodlights are on, because I know the clubs that we've invested into, and, you know, the, you know, I remember watching Fraser a couple of years ago, and, you know, the value of that investment to us was that they had a game live on television against Rangers at the time, now, had that game not been able to go ahead because of any issues with an old flood lighting system, you know, that there's costs that are, um, and also the cost of the reputation of Scottish football, I think, uh, in terms of that being a showcase competition. So, so club infrastructure at the professional end of the game is something we've invested in quite heavily. Um, we've invested into elite uh, development for youth players and academy through Club Academy Scotland and its predecessor, uh, the, youth, the Youth Action Plan. Um, we've also then, you know, grassroots support, one of our probably our biggest projects is our um, containerized changing room project, which supports community activity, 60 sites currently. Uh, and, you know, that supporting infrastructure supports about 14,000 uh, players annually. Uh, so a very, very important project for us, which has been going now for about 12 years. So in terms of the financial impact, uh, pretty big, I would suggest. Um, we would like to do more, as, as I mentioned earlier on, you know, we don't have the luxury of the, you know, the annual millions and billions that come into, to, you know, uh, our neighbours down south. But, um, you know, we we do, uh, you know, invest as much as we can into into the game. And, and, and again, some of the, the other areas that we might support, I was looking at some notes earlier on, you know, 36 3G pitch projects uh, over the last eight years. We've, we've invested a million pounds into that, but that's also helped leverage another 14 million pounds from other partners, including Sports Scotland, local authorities, uh, the clubs themselves so you know playing a part in quite a big investment into, into and, and again that's across the game that's at professional level in terms of facilities that you might see at Stenhouse Muir on their, on their artificial surface all the way down to um, you know a community football club um, you know like Dundee East for example so uh, quite, quite again quite a broad brush to that to that investment um, and uh, yeah it's, it's been good to it's always good to invest in to make something better so it's quite a you know, certainly it's a rewarding position that I, I find myself in. Yeah, pretty much so. Um, and just about, so I suppose taking a step back, your sort of personal journey in terms of going from playing the game um, and now sort of, as you mentioned, heading up both the, the partnership and the trust, how did that come about? What was your sort of journey? What were the stepping stones that led to that? I suppose a little bit of preparation and some good and bad luck, I suppose. Um, you know, in terms of uh, my playing career, I had a, a pretty nasty foot injury September 2011. Um, and sort of by that sort of Christmas of that year, I knew that I was going to be struggling to come back with, you know, six months left of my contract. Not a great situation, but I had been, you know, in the, in the previous few years starting to really think about, you know, even though I was only 31 then, I was I was thinking about what was going to come next. You know, I, I was some study with the, the Open University, some study at college, um, you know, attended pretty much anything that PFA Scotland would put on in terms of, you know, developing myself to be ready to, to take that next step into to the workplace. Um, I was involved in the management committee at PFA Scotland. Uh, I became the players chairman at PFA Scotland. I, um, you know, I had one eye on the future as that injury happened. Um, the bit of luck really was that um, the, the chief executive of PFA Scotland is Fraser Wishart, who is also a director in the football partnership. Um, and my predecessor, uh, Paul Barnes, had been in the job about six months. His passion was uh, journalism. Uh, I think Paul still works for STV. And he, at the time, had an opportunity to go and work in Leeds for the BBC. And at quite short notice, the partnership was uh, was looking for someone to go in at that point to be the kind of company secretary. 
Um, I went for an interview in January um, while still doing rehab at Morton at the time when I was playing. And uh, they were keen to get me on board. And I kind of worked in amongst doing rehab at the football partnership to um, probably not part time, but kind of three quarters time for the rest of, of what, what that season uh, was to sort of May. And then as I retired for that, from a foot injury in, in the May time, I moved into the role full time. So a little bit of fortune, I think, but I hope I positioned myself well at the time to be ready for the, the job. Albeit, you know, I was very, you know, very, again, very fortunate to be allowed to develop on the job. Um, you know, accounting and finance, you know, minute writing, um, you know, general governance and administration. Not a huge amount of experience, uh, if any, um, but working for a, a, a brilliant, you know, board of directors who really supported me in those early days allowed me to develop the bits that I didn't have. The bits that I did have was the, you know, ability to communicate and speak to people at, you know, at the right level, whether I was speaking to a, a club chairman and professional end of the game or a, or a grassroots coach and volunteer. I think I had that I had that part of the job. So the other parts of, you know, obviously I had to develop over the last nine years. What was what was that like, sort of making that change from playing to to going behind the scenes? Was that a big leap or did you a natural transition to make? Yeah, it was, it's funny when I look back, um, I suppose when your boss tells you the job is what you make it, it initially doesn't give you a huge amount of steer as to what it's going to be. But, um, you know, I remember we were based at St Mirren and at the time, St Mirren's uh, ground, sorry, and at the time we had a very, very small office. It was maybe a glorified cupboard and, you know, there was a computer in there, a printer and a phone, a mobile phone and a company car and really just, you know, kind of find your way into the job and, and it's kind of what I did, and it was, it was I suppose, it was, it was a little bit daunting, but it was also exciting because when you when you do play and you start to see, you know, you know the kind of final furlong of your career, it's quite, it's quite a worrying time as a player because you just really want someone to tell you what you're going to do next. You know, you want to know what what is it I'm going to do. You know, I had, in amongst some of the preparation, I'd, I'd, I'd made to, to kind of leave the game. I'd also been thinking about, you know, coaching, you know, a license for the Scottish FA. I'd, you know, I'd, I suppose I just really wanted to know what was going to come next. Um, but, but I suppose it was exciting as well because you were, you know, you were doing a lot, you, you know, your life was slightly different. You know, I didn't quite have the same level of restriction on it as I had when I was, um, you know, when I was playing uh, in terms of that weekly preparation. I had a young family at the time. It gave me a little bit more, you know, security that I wasn't living, you know, year to year in terms of contracts. So, I think it was daunting, but at the same time, really exciting and something that I, you know, I was keen to embrace and to to see where it could take me. Absolutely, and it sort of it seems to have sort of grown as well since you since you started as well. So it must be a sort of a completely different animal in some respects to what you started with. Yeah, I think it is, and I think particularly when you, you consider the you know the development of the of the charitable side, which again was you know something we had we all had to learn about and how we we developed and. and and try to take that forward. So, I think that's been uh, yeah, it's, it's been really exciting. And you're right, it has it has developed from something you know that invested into certain areas of the game to something that's really it really is quite diverse. And uh, you know, and some of the conversations I have are, are quite incredible. You know, depending on who picks up the phone, whether it's the you know it could be the chairman of Elgin City, Graham Tatter's getting in contact with me about a facility project, or it could be you know a grassroots club looking to do something on a on a kind of local level. So it's. But yeah, it's, it's a really interesting interesting job. It's always good to be make, trying to make things up that little bit better. Um, it's you know very very rewarding from from someone who's interested in football. I've, I've been in it for so many years, and it's been really really nice to you know to, to stay in an area of uh, I suppose of, of work where I'm you know I think I'm most comfortable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just talking about the sort of charitable side and the, and the, the, the you've got numerous sort of funds that. Um, support the grassroots aspect of the game i wondered if you could maybe touch upon some of those in terms of like the club development grant scheme um the club sustainability initiative and some of the other funds that are open to clubs to apply for yeah so the 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 club development grant scheme is something that we that we work on with our partners uh, through the, the scottish gfa in terms of the regional staff so we work with each of the six regions to to identify clubs who are who are looking to do uh, you know, looking to support their, you know, their, their club development plan, uh, kind of three strands to that. It's it's about, um, you know, increasing participation. So that's maybe, you know, clubs are looking to start a new section. That might be a new uh, girl section, for example. It may be a, 
a, a para football section. Um, it may be about you know looking at the club and saying, okay, we don't have a, a team playing at a certain age group, so there's a bit of funding that goes in to try and support that initial startup cost. Um, and, and and with that, uh, there's also some costs that the volunteer coaches may have to bear. So there's coach education, there's sports first aid, um, which is our layer of, of 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 the support. So it's about perhaps starting up new activity, supporting the coaches, but also the kind of third strand is about sustaining and enhancing activity. So, you know, some of the clubs may have and need to have, you know, better equipment, uh, something that's certainly been the case this year through through COVID and some of the new things and challenges clubs have, have faced. So um, so the grants, are, those grants are a value of £500. And, um, you know, we, we've been running that scheme now for about five years. Uh, it's, again, it's developed. Initially, it was very much just about growing the game and just about new participation. We had some success from that, but we felt that we wanted to do, you know, to tell the clubs to be a little bit more creative, but at the same time bring that sort of direct investment into them to to try and support their their aspirations and their needs. So, so that's one of the strands of, of, of again, it's a, a kind of an annual project at the moment. Um, we, we are hoping to announce quite soon that 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 will run again in in 2021. Uh, we're very fortunate to work very closely with the Kilpatrick Fraser Charitable Trust, who've helped support that strand in the last couple of years obviously another Scottish charity. Um, so we're looking to hopefully engage with them quite soon to, to try and get that one going again. Um, the club IT sustainability was, was really something um, we were quite taken by a, a system called My Club Hub, um, um, which is really a, a kind of club management system, uh, which tries to you know make clubs more efficient, uh, helps with things like payment collection, helps with governance, helps with communication. And we liked the idea of that type of system, and, and we had a presentation from from the principal there, John Cleesham. And uh, whilst we, we are mindful of not endorsing any one product, uh, we, we were we, we thought we would put together a little bit of a strand that would allow clubs who were interested in that type of system. Now they could come with a different one if they wanted to have a bit of seed funding to help the startup costs of that particular uh, system. So, um, so that was something new for us last year. It's been. Um, pretty successful. Um, I think we've had uh, 10 clubs have, have come on board so far uh, with grants to help support those needs and, and one of them being Devon Vale who uh, in a recent publication uh, we had a little bit of a um, case study on and, and I don't think it's any coincidence that they were um, you know they were Scotland's Community Club of the Year I think in 2020. Now that was not solely down to my club hub and the system but I think it shows you that clubs at that type of level, operating at that level, do need something that makes them, you know, more efficient, uh, something that supports their volunteers in terms of that reduction in administration time. Um, and I think more and more clubs will look towards that because it's, um, you know, they're all becoming, you know, little businesses and they're, they're, they're expanding into taking on facilities, um, perhaps some public ownership. And, and again, that's another part of our work, you know, our facility support for, for grassroots clubs, um, it's something that we've, we've we've been involved in for a number of years, and since the trust has has been established, that investment has continued through through the trust into to grassroots projects. Yeah, the, the, I can absolutely vouch for my club hub as well. I use that in a sort of personal capacity. I think it's a fantastic system, and uh, we actually also spoke to Kevin Stewart from Devon Vale uh, yeah. last week. So, um, you know, as I say, I think you. It's great to see that sort of correlation between sort of very progressive clubs investing in sustainability and things that are going to improve the efficiency of the club. So it's great that there's funding for those types of initiatives. Um, you, you mentioned it, so I don't have to, which is good. The, the situation with COVID, I wondered yeah. if you can just talk about the kind of level of support, the sort of huge support that the trust has been able to offer Scottish football during what's been an incredibly hard period. Yeah, so very fortunate to engage with uh, James Anderson um, in June of last year. Really, he um, he had obviously invested into some of the professional end of the game through through the SPFL Trust, which was fantastic to see. Um, and he was also keen at that time to, to engage and look at girls and women's football, which was obviously you know difficult time just as you start your your season just as things are really growing you know the, the inaugural season of the championship two-tier system leading into you know the you know, sort of premiership level of the game everything trending in the right direction and bang football has to stop just as it's about to start so really difficult time um he was really keen to, to try and do something to try and help you know the, the real focus on our work there was to 
provide some investment into the club so that they would still be around when football was able to return and, and to maybe try and help um, maybe the game and training start and the activity start a little bit sooner if we could bring some investment into the club. So, um, yeah, really, really fortunate. I think the between Mr Anderson and our anonymous donor who then provided some like um, £100,000 in to support the championship clubs, you add all that into the mix and you, you add on gift aid, which we were able to claim and uh, you know, the total support package to clubs and to the SWF was £437,500, which was 100% of the money that came in and 100% of the of the gift aid. So, you know, that that I can honestly say that every single penny that came in, it was an emergency situation. We wanted to get the money out to support Scottish women's football and the clubs, and every single penny uh, and more actually went out uh, to, to try and help. So uh, something we were, you know, really proud of. Um, again, you know, a couple of months later, um, as you can imagine, a number of organisations had, had got in touch with, with us, you know, organisations that we work with, yeah, you know, every year, Scottish Youth FA, Schools FA, you know, the the junior FA, everyone was kind of getting in contact, you know, explaining their, you know, their, you know, their predicament. And um, whilst we couldn't help everyone, um, you know, we did, you know, reach out to Mr. Anderson again in terms of the Scottish Youth FA and some of the challenges that they faced. Um, and again, you know, a significant amount of money came in from Mr. Anderson, which we which we were able to claim gifted on and, you know, just under £320,000 um, has been pledged. Um, the majority of that has gone directly to the Scottish Youth FA and that will cover the affiliation fees for every single club. Um, there's over 4,000, sorry, every single team, which there are over 4,000 of, as you, as you know, in Scotland. Um, so that, that means that every club will have a reduction in cost to participate. Um, now, if you're a club with many teams, that's a significant amount of money. Um, so it was something we wanted to do. The other kind of strand to that investment we'll see as supporting a thousand coaches through um, through Scottish FA coaching um, badges this year, uh, and uh, with our partnership with the Hamden Sports Clinic, we'll again we'll we'll contribute to a thousand coaches uh, going through sports first aid training. So it's it, it's a nice way to I think uh, extend that support you know to the clubs and to the volunteers who you know who have been suffering who who make football happen in Scotland. And again, I'm really, really keen to stress the point that all of that money that came in, every single penny, has uh, has gone back out. It's not been anything that the trust has held on to. Um, if anything, we've actually added to it, uh, these, you know, with some of our internal funds and covering things like legal costs. That's all been done because the trustees were so keen to make sure that in a crisis that we could we could help the game. So, so that's what we did. That's great to know that the game's got that kind of level of support and. Maybe, you know, I suppose, as we said at the start, just a little before we start recording, kind of a silver lining to COVID has been the support that's come in from, from other people that perhaps wouldn't have come in otherwise. Yeah, and, and you know, we certainly hope that, you know, that we've, we've given our donors a, a positive experience this year. You know, we, we hope to, to engage with them again. Um, and as things start to improve, you know, we hope that that investment it's slightly different. It's not about an emergency. It's about again thinking about how do we how do we make things like facilities better for for, for clubs. You know, I, I think uh, unfortunately because of the the financial challenges, it'd be very very difficult for you know football on a local level to have the same pitches and pavilions accessible to them. I, I think um, there's going to be more and more community asset transfer out of out of necessity. Um, but I think it's important that when we, we ask communities to take on facilities that they have to be fit for purpose, they have to be um, sustainable and we have to do our best to give them a, you know, a, a helping hand from the outset, not, not just pass them on a problem and just say you guys go and fix it because we're already asking them to you know, support the young people at their club, um, you know, to fundraise, to do all the things that they do and all the time that they give up, which is incredible. And people don't, you know, the general public don't realise, I don't think, how much goes in in terms of those volunteer hours and what the actual value of it is to, to society and to those young people. So I think it's important that we give, you know, football on a community level a platform to grow. So, I, you know, I, I hope to engage with, with funders, you know, you know, you know, past and present and, and hopefully more in the future. And, and hopefully we can, you know, channel money into the, the, the SFP Trust 
that will go back out to support football at that level. And facilities, I think, are key to that because we need we need places for people to play and we need to continue to try and improve these. Mm-hmm. So, so just looking ahead to, to 2021, is there anything in particular that clubs should be looking out for from the, the trust and partnership? Is there going to be some new developments? Or well, I think we will... Um, yeah, I think we will try and expand again on our things like our club development grant scheme. Um, we have, you know, some discussions ongoing with uh, with both stakeholders at the moment about about investment and how we might want to channel that. Um, as I said, just just there, I'm really really keen to to engage with some of our our bigger donors again and, and look at how we can we can change how we we invest, you know, these funds in, into the, into new areas. So it's um, I think it's a difficult time. I think I think it's a time we are. You know, money isn't um, going to be easy to access. So I think we have to be mindful of that. And I think we have to do everything that we can to try and continue to make things a little bit better. But, you know, we have to recognise that it will be challenging because, you know, across all sectors, you know, things aren't good at the moment. So <clears throat> if there was a club listening to this and they were interested in, in reaching out to, the, to the, the trust door partnership, is there any advice that you would perhaps offer terms of um, things that you would be looking for from an application? Well, I think with any funder, whether it's ourselves or it's Sports Scotland or Robertson Trust or whoever, I, th- I always think that the best thing to do is to, to reach out before you fill in a form. I think it's it's speaking to, you know, people like myself or, or the staff at Sports Scotland to find out, you know, what is your project? Is it going to be eligible for funding? Um, and to what level? Now, these levels may, may vary and, and may be different, you know, as we move out of, of this pandemic. But for me, the it's not not quite the worst thing you can do, but just following in a form and, and sending it in without reading it and, and asking for more than you can actually achieve, it, it just means that you know funders you almost you can kind of get their back up because the first thing you've done is you've shown you haven't you haven't read the form, you haven't understood that, for example, the, the funding threshold is this. You haven't understood perhaps that they have got some key areas of the game that or, or, or the sport or whatever it is that you're trying to do that they want to you know, to fund and they will fund. So I think it's important to really get an understanding of, of what that is. Um, and probably the last thing to be doing is actually filling in the form. You know, it's actually about creating uh, and being able to, you know, to understand what they're looking for from you. And every funder's different. I'm interested in football, uh, clearly, but, you know, take the Robertson Trust, it might be more about the social impact of what your project is going to do. So so that room that I'm interested in as a as a changing room, might be something else in the eyes of the Robertson Trust. It may be something else. So I think it's important to, to understand your funder, look at read, read their guidelines, speak to them, um, and, and and then be realistic, I suppose, about about what um, because a funder might say their maximum award is a certain amount, but it doesn't always mean that you will qualify for that maximum amount. So I think it's worth the, the engagement part. I think just makes it a lot easier because um, you start off on a good footing. They, they are, people appreciate you asking for some guidance rather than them having to go back and walk you through what you should have done. So I think it's probably speaking to people is, 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 the, is the key and, uh, and taking some and asking for help. You know, people, are, you know, I say to you, I'll, I'll, I can come out, but not under normal circumstances, I'll come out and help you understand how to fill in the form, what we're looking for from you. It's probably the best part of the job actually being able to do that. So, you know, ask people to help because when it comes in, you've then, you've then created the, you know the the content that they're looking for, um, rather than having to continue to go back to you, you know, and ask for something. So definitely, that engagement is key. I think from the outset. That's really interesting. I think because I think that's probably something a lot of clubs wouldn't think about doing in the first instance. I think, as you say, probably rush to fill in the form straight away. But actually having that engagement, um, I suspect a lot of them don't even appreciate that they're able to do that, or or um, that the the funder would be more than willing to to have that conversation. Yeah, I think I think it's important, particularly when you look at bigger projects where you'll have multiple agencies on that funding profile. My advice would always be, you know, if it was football, my 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 engagement would be initially with you know the regional staff. We 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 follow our funding follows things like um, quality mark accreditation. So one of the things pillars of our funding is we look for clubs at grassroots level to to have that or at least be on that journey towards quality mark. So. You know, if you've got a project, uh, let's take something, you know, you want to develop a new 3G pitch, which, you know, is something very, very popular on a community level. You know, I would be questioning why you haven't spoken to your football development officer and your staff so that they know about your project, so that they 
they can understand because when you start to ask, does that project fit with the club's development plan? Does it have the capacity? Does it is is it realistic to say that we can we can find six hundred and fifty thousand pounds to build that pitch when there's one just a hundred yards down the road? You know, so I, I think the engagement there and, and bringing people together. If you've got a cat, a, you know, a series of funders, bring them all together in the one room at the same time. You know, get them together. And it gives, the, it gives me as a funder confidence if, if I'm sitting in a room in Sports Scotland are saying, yep, we are, we are interested in funding the project. The local authority are there. They're keen to back it and invest into it. Rather than, you know, an application form which has a, a series of funders down on it. And I don't know whether the money's pledged or it's even been applied for or, you know, it's even realistic. Um, but, but clubs you know, probably should realise as well, you know, funders do talk, you know, you know, people will phone me and say, a club have got you down for £50,000 in this project, is that realistic? And I'll say, no, that's not realistic. You know, that, that you know, our maximum award is X at that particular time. And similarly with Sports Scotland, so the funders talk, so it's worth getting them all in the room to begin with. And to, and again, ask for help. That's, as a fund, I want to be able to help. I don't want to have to take you back to you having to fill in the form again. To you having to provide all this information because you know we can't make a decision until we have it so it's better to to understand and it just it just presents the club in a professional manner right from the outset i think mm -hmm. yeah absolutely but but equally i have i have to then take a step back from that and also you know but you know when we do receive something that isn't you know that at the level we're looking for we are mindful that you know volunteers this is not their day job these people are running their lives they're running football clubs they are working extremely hard you know if if something isn't you know they are you know i'm still really keen to go work with them to get it to the right level because we understand that you know a poorly written application might still have a really good project in it so um and equally you know some of them work you know on the face of it fantastic looking applications that are actually when you scratch away at them maybe not quite um you know all that they're cracked up to be so so we, we, we do understand and we really want to help. So, um, but it is always best, I think, to start on a on a sure footing with all funders. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. Thank you. Um, last question, which is kind of a more general question and I suppose a bit of a personal opinion of yours. So you've obviously been involved with the game for a long time now, both playing professionally and now as Chief Operating Officer at the Trust and Partnership. And so you would have worked and supported a number of different football clubs during that period of time over throughout your career. I wondered what you thought were the kind of key attributes a club needed to be um, successful off the pitch in terms of how they're set up and, and governance and structure. Yeah, so I'm, I'm obviously mindful that I've never worked at a club in, in, in that kind of business sense. You know, I, I was as a player, I suppose I did pick up uh, and I was very fortunate to play some, you know, you know, well put together clubs, Bernie and Aberdeen, St Johnston and Lovness. Uh, who I think they were always able to, you know, to, to you know to to look at how they invested, and it wasn't always just about how much money we could throw at the first team. They all, they were mindful of that investment and the infrastructure around about the club. Um, so I suppose it is that, you know, for me, always living within your means uh, as a, as a club, having the right structure and governance uh, to to allow you to develop and grow, because you know. Good and bad seasons will come and go, um, but uh, I think for me it's about that sustained journey, um, and, and and looking at you know training facilities, how you how you interact with your fans, how you you know how you treat your players, uh, because I think I always think most important people in football are players because that's what people turn up to to see. As uh, so I maybe I you know maybe I still get my players hat on as I think about that, but it's important look after your staff, look after your players, you know. And uh, work towards a plan. I think the challenge we have in football is that it's um, it's the emotion, isn't it? It's the it's the the knee jerk reactions that people don't make in other businesses. Um, I, I would certainly like to see more players transition from the playing side into the business side because I think I think players have a have a lot to offer. I was really fortunate to take part in a PFA Scotland. Um, organised and funded course last year at Napier University uh, with a, a group of you know guys who are still playing, some of them managing now, James McPake being one of those managers. And the knowledge in the room every time we got together was quite quite incredible. Um, 
So there's a, there's a you know there's a pool of people ready to transition from their playing days into whether it's management in a you know in a footballing sense or it's in that business side of, of a club. I think there's a real um, there's a real talent there that we, we need to tap into because I think it's difficult to come from another business into football. You know I know many business people do it, um, but it's such a unique you know environment and it's as I say people I see I've seen people do things that they would never do in their you know, in their day job at a football club because it is that passion. It's the, you know, it's what happens between three o'clock and quarter to five is seen as as the be on end all. But I think the more successful clubs are the ones who, you know, you know, I think about my time at Inverness, you know, we we ran a pretty tight ship. You know, the we had good people around about the club who knew what the club could do and could achieve. And we, we built towards it. Um and we, you know we didn't overspend on on that journey. So um I, I think it's probably uh it's steady progress and investing in all aspects of the club and and uh, as we know our, our fans are so important we have to make sure that we're uh, you know we're thinking about them and, and we need them to come because you know that income is so important to, to a football club no, that's really valuable advice thank you um so just finally if there were any clubs that weren't as unlikely i un- know but if there were any clubs that were listening to this that, were, that weren't sure how to get in touch or find out a bit more about either the trust or the partnership how could they reach out and get in touch yeah, so we have a through our website, which is www.thescottishfootballpartnership.com. We have a, an online inquiry form, uh, details of how to get in touch with us, uh, both on on the telephone and on email. Um, we're on Twitter, Facebook. Um, we will communicate, you know, through social media if people get in touch, which they sometimes do. So yeah, really, um, you know, get in touch with us. You know, happy to help and, and to to deal with inquiries. Um, you know, as they come in and. You know, under normal circumstances, you know, as I said, the best bet is always getting out and getting around the clubs and speaking to people. Um, and, and we're kind of excited about the prospect of that coming in, hopefully in the not too distant future when, you know, when things hopefully start to improve. And, um, you know, we're, we're keen to be here in 2021 and to help. And, you know, it's the start of a year that we, we hope will, um, you know, will, will, will be better than last, I suppose. Well, thank you so much for your time. Really, really appreciate that. Pleasure. So there we go. That was Stuart McCaffrey, Chief Operating Officer at the Scottish Football Partnership and Trust. I really, really enjoyed that interview, um, picking Stuart's brains about his transition from playing to um, working professionally within um, the, the sort of funding sector of Scottish football. Really interesting to hear about how he made that transition. But also great to hear about the level of support that um, clubs in Scotland are able to benefit from. Um, huge level of impact some huge numbers that were mentioned there in terms of the amount of funds that have been distributed through through both the trust and the partnership uh and some really exciting um developments to come from them i'm sure in, in 2021 also some really good tips there for um clubs that are thinking about applying for funding not just to the trust or partnership but more generally um good good pieces of advice about speaking to the funder um beforehand so very very valuable uh, interview there with Stuart and, and huge thanks for his time a nice kind of um, segue really because he discusses both uh, Devon Vale who were guests on our podcast last week um, but also um, mentions my club hub who will be our guests on next week so this is kind of a nice segue between the two nice link them all together so um, look out for both of those if you haven't um, and we'll look forward to speaking to you next week <laughs>